Gibbs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And welcome to the Summer of Professional Development, the first session of Teaching Bioscience Through an Islamic Lens, Tackling Big Questions, Solidifying Faith. This is an overview of the six curriculum modules and pedagogical tools and practices to help you implement it. So before we get in, I'll begin, of course, as we always should, with Bismillah Rahmani Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Yahya Van Roy. I am a board member at ISLA. I've been involved for many years, uh, formerly as the lead of community development. And it's a great honor to be joining you all today, actually from the W. Bruce Phi History of Medicine Library as part of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, and I'll just mention I had a look at Ibn Sina's, one of his books from the a version from the 1500s. And I've also been on this blessed day of Ashura, allowed to look through this Quran, uh, which is from the year 1545, 952 Hijri. So very um, kind of special space I'm in for this uh, first session. Um, so Bismillah. Uh, first, a little bit about Isla. ISLA stands for the Islamic Schools League of America. We connect Islamic school professionals to share knowledge, ideas, and resources, and we've been doing that work for the past 20 years plus, alhamdulillah. We serve over 300 plus full-time Islamic schools, 60,000 plus Muslim students, that's K through 12 nationwide, and our email listserv connects 5,000 education professionals. We have a comprehensive database of Islamic schools, and we also look at the landscape of Islamic schools in the U.S. to gauge progress and areas of need. So our three areas of focus are research, resources, and relationships. About the initiative on Islam and medicine. The initiative on Islam and medicine is a leading research center at the intersection of Islam and biomedicine. We produce groundbreaking scholarship that impacts the lives of Muslim patients, healthcare providers and religious leaders using an innovative approach that draws insights from a diverse set of disciplinary experts from across the theological, social, and biomedical sciences as a platform for impactful research, tailored education, and creative dialogue. IINM's focuses on improving the health of American Muslims and developing an academic multidisciplinary field of Islamic bioethics. I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Asim Padella. Dr. Asim Padella is an internationally renowned clinician researcher with scholarly FOSI in the, at the intersections of healthcare, bioethics, and religion. He is the director of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine and a professor with tenure of emergency medicine, bioethics, and the medical humanities at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In addition to being vice chair of research and scholarship in the Department of Emergency Medicine, he holds teaching and research appointments in the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities within the Institute for Health and Equity at the Center for Advancing Population Science in the Cancer Center. Additionally, his academic training includes visiting fellowships at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies and the International Institute for Islamic Thought. He has authored over 120 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and is an editor or co-editor of several books, including Medicine and Sharia, a Dialogue in Islamic Bioethics from 2021, Islam and Biomedicine 2022, and Organ Donation in Islam, the Interplay of Jurisprudence, Ethics, and Society in 2022. And uh, Dr. Asam is the director of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine. We also have with us uh, Sister Aisha Basit, who is a seasoned educator with experience teaching students in grades five to 12. She has her bachelor's in education and biology and has been a teacher for 19 years. She has taught high school honors in AP biology, she also has experience teaching in public schools and Islamic schools, as well as homeschooling. 
Sister Aisha served three years in an administrative role. In addition, Sister Aisha studied in an al Alamiya program under traditional scholars in Chicago at Hajira Foundation, which is now Sharia Board of America, and online abroad at Daraloom Online and Mariam Institute. She is currently a biology tutor and teaches Tajweed, Quran, Arabic, and Tafsir classes to local women and children children of Peoria, Illinois, where she currently resides. So we have very esteemed uh, team here with us today. Um, I also just uh, acknowledge that Dr. Shaza Khan, the executive director of ISLA is here with us. Uh, Dr. Shaza, did you wanna say any words before we begin? No, thank you so much. Um, Brother Yahya will be uh, helping facilitate on behalf of ISLA these four sessions and um, we're really excited to get into it. Thank you so much. And and Brother Habib Qadri is also here with um, high quality educational consultants. And um, these organizations have been integrally involved in helping develop this curriculum, which you will be learning about. So we're so happy to have you all here and welcome to all of you. Jazakallah khairan for taking time out of your busy and precious summer schedule and on this blessed day of Ashura. Jazakallah khair. Okay, well, looking forward to getting started now. Um, may Allah facilitate our efforts and grant us tawfiq. Bidunya wa fil akhira. With that, I will pass it over to Sister Aisha. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasil li amri wa ahlun uqdatan min lisani yifqahu qawli. So Jazakallah khair for all of you for attending. Uh, we really do appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's been a privilege. And so inshallah, I will begin with just uh, first of all, um, under letting you guys know that you guys all are our esteemed guests today. Um, so I want to make sure that we have that in mind. So that way we are understanding that we are trying to cater to you and whatever else that you guys would need, inshallah, so that way we can make this experience a very beneficial one, inshallah. So with that, let's start um, with a reflective activity. Um, and again, I would like to make this, there we go. Um, so I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, right? We're gonna try as much as possible, I know, Alhamdulillah, today is the day of Ashura. So perhaps some of you are fasting, but inshallah, that will only add to our barakah. Um, and I'd like to make it so that way we're getting as much thoughts and feedback from our audience, from you all as educators, so that way we can really make this uh, a robust curriculum that's going to cater to the things that you guys see in the classroom. Um, so first and foremost, I would like to ask all of you um, in the chat, if you guys can answer this question for me, that what are the biology or science topics um, that you have grappled with, right? Perhaps these are questions that you are questioning, how does science integrate with your Islamic values and beliefs? Or what biology science topics have your students presented to you that you struggled perhaps to answer? Um, or would like to know how to answer those questions uh, a little bit better, right? And perhaps more effectively. So I'll give you guys just about a minute or so to do that. Um, but as you're doing that, I want to remind all of you um, that I would recommend that all of you guys have kind of a reflective journal, right? Just somewhere, something to write down your notes, um, thoughts that you've had, things that you've learned, um, things that you are kind of picking up on and whatever questions that you might, that might arise, that inshallah we'll probably get to the questions towards the end. Um, and this will help to help understand what it is that you are learning out of these uh, professional development seminars and how does that going to affect your future teaching? Inshallah. So kind of looking at here, uh, the biggest comment, and as we ex expected, is the topic of evolution, inshallah. Um, and we have a mix of genetics in there, which we'll cover in the evolutionary section as well, inshallah. Um, I see here a few topics that I would take note of, inshallah, that we will discuss perhaps towards the end. Um, but I see evolution as being kind of that main aspect. And inshallah, we'll have to wait till the next session on Thursday to, to cover that evolution topic. So inshallah, we look forward to seeing you guys then, inshallah. Wonderful. Okay. So we've got mental health. We've got transgender transitioning. And inshallah, our goal is to try to see if we can touch upon all of these. If not, 
the topic directly, we will give you skills to be able to address those topics. To be inshallah. Um, so moving on from there, what I would like to start with, as uh, Brother Yahya also mentioned, right? If we begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost. And then the second thing that we need to begin with is having clearly outlined mindful and meaningful intentions, right? As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has mentioned, in the mal a'malu bin niyad, right? That our, indeed, our amal, our actions are due to or because or based on our intentions. So we have these specific intentions in mind so that way we can benefit from our amal of learning here today. And we need to look at our purpose and intention of doing so. So these are the objectives that we have for the entire uh, series, uh, the four sessions that we have. Um, and so just to kind of cover those and understand what our objectives are, you all as participants will become aware of the current debate surrounding science and religion, education and learning. And with that, we'll explore models of research-based instruction, including answering the five fundamental questions about the human being. And we'll get to what those are um, in detail, inshallah, just in just a minute. We'll also outline our motivations for learning about this intersect, right? And that's kind of why I had you guys answer that reflective question is because we want to make sure that you are also reflecting on what it means to integrate this information into our classrooms um, and really reflect on what our prior knowledge and experience is in teaching these scientific topics and how we can make those uh, uh, improvements, inshallah. And then we also would like to have you all understand the basic concept of the four C skills. And those four C skills are critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And again, not only for our students, but for ourselves as well, right? First and foremost. And then we're, we'll examine the implementation of these topics that are being presented, implementation of those four Cs, and consider the usability of this information in each of our classrooms as well. And as you'll probably see more so today, we'll reflect on our learning and uh, improve our own professional practices with these, the covering of these topics, inshallah. And then, uh, inshallah, today we'll focus a lot on identifying definitions, examples, and strategies, and some of the resources that are available for teaching these topics in the Exploring Bioscience and Islam curriculum. So just again, to keep that connection going, thumbs up that we're okay with those objectives. If there's any objective that you guys all came in with the intention of learning, I'd like you to put that in the chat. That is there anything that was is missing here that you expected to gain out of these PD sessions, inshallah. So with that, those are our intentions for the professional development curriculum, right? And so for our intentions for our students, right? What do I we want the curriculum to do for our students? These are our main objectives, right? First and foremost, this curriculum equips teachers to guide Muslim students to critically examine science, right? Moving beyond the norm of blind acceptance instead of simply accepting scientific claims, well, science says it, so we must believe it, right? And students will learn to analyze and understand the limitations of science and its benefits, right? So we're shifting from this kind of passive acceptance of, to, of science to an active analysis. Right. And so we aim to build students confidence and yaqeen and foster a genuine appreciation of uh, how Islamic is Islam is holistic uh, in addressing scientific topics. And it really in that will highlight kind of the limitations of a secular view of science. Right. Um, and here, the second point, we would like to make sure we build that conceptual literacy. Right. And that's how we aim to accomplish point number one is that when we build that conceptual literacy uh, at the intersect of bioscience and theology among Muslim students, this helps to combat that secular conditioning that is present in our society today. And that we perhaps unknowingly have adopted within our own spheres as well. And last but not least, having a wahi focused worldview, right? And so we want to cultivate confidence in using wahi as a genuine source and so when we use wahi, along with understanding and using knowledge from our rational faculties, from empirical data and empirical information, then this curriculum is going to help us understand and broaden that horizon and understanding the, these fundamental questions 
uh, about the human being. And so we'll see here that when we are informed by Wahi, this helps us to tackle these critical topics of biology and science that might cause, cause confusion in the minds and hearts of Muslim students. And so by applying this type of holistic uh, epistemological framework, us educators can help our students to gain that clarity and extend these topics to things that perhaps aren't covered in the curriculum, but we can use those skills to then apply to other topics as well. So what I'd like to do is talk about this understanding of how um, this really connects Islam and science, right? So we need to understand what is that connection between Islam and science, right? So when we think, we look at the Quran, right? Allah SWT begins to introduce himself in the Quran as Rabbul Alameen. Right, we see this in Surah Fatiha right in the beginning. And so Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all the worlds, right? Singular would be Alam, right? Alam, just world. And so we know the word Alam, right? And I'm gonna give you a very quick uh, Arabic uh, lesson here. So bear with me, inshallah. Um, is that Alam means the world, but it comes from Alima, which means to know, right? So the Alam is what we know. So you'll see in Arabic, Alam, is actually on the pattern of Ismul Ala, which means a, the pattern of using a tool, right? Or an instrument. And so this world is an instrument for us to know. And what is that enabling us to know? This world is enabling us to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This world or the knowledge that we gain from this world, right? The amal of examining it and analyzing it, studying it, which is science, right? Is what enables us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah SWT has created this world to fulfill this purpose of getting to know him, having a relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we have this understanding of this is what the purpose of the world is for us, then it allows us to kind of have this paradigm shift of how we want our students to look at. Them. And when we see that the students are understanding that science and deen are not two completely separate realms, but in reality, there are realms that can. Impact. Then we see how we can consciously tackle this understanding of a secular version of Islam, right? Uh, or sorry, secular version of science. And so for this reason, I've been trying very consciously not to refer to science as a secular topic, right? Whereas in many times we think of, okay, math, science, social, these are secular subjects. And Islam is a religious subject, right? And we want to make sure that students view science as something that can also inform, right? And our Islam is what dictates how we understand these things, right? And this kind of paradigm shift and understanding of the world really humbles us as human beings, right? When we're learning and having knowledge, we understand that this is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how we can have this relationship with him. And so this is where we're gonna get that ilm and amal all put together in looking at the alam, right? Looking at the world. Um, and so again, looking at how Islam approaches this concept is that we are encouraged to ask questions, right? And this is where we kind of the viewpoints of how this specialized curriculum is going to benefit us and help us is that we are encouraged to ask questions with that those right intentions, right? We should have the intention to learn, to benefit and gain knowledge more so with the intention and understanding of increasing our yaqeen, right? And increasing that yaqeen will result in increased obedience and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Which is our hope and aim. So the Muslims of the past, they asked questions too, right? They looked for those answers to those questions, but it also did not result without conflict, right? There were clashes with their religious thought as well, but they had to work through them. They had to understand and make sense of what it is that they observed and found. And so this is what we'd like to inculcate with our students as well, right? There, there will be, right? Not kind of paint a imaginary picture or, or idealistic picture that you won't have conflicts once you know this information, right? It's that this is how we can understand it and how we can tackle it in a very productive manner. And so we're really seeing today how dangerous it is, especially in today's world, that if we leave our Muslim students ill-equipped to address these types of topics, right, that when we're faced with 
um, conflict between science and Islam, and they don't know how to merge the two, right? We're witnessing the significant portion of our Muslim community, right, especially amongst the young, um, leaning towards science and therefore slowly moving away from their deen, right? And this is where we want to make sure that this specialized curriculum is going to address that, right? So this is the need of the hour, which is why this is important that we understand kind of what are those skills that we need to learn and teach to our Muslim students. Um, and then again, this curriculum asked these questions and these questions were addressed by both Muslim scientists and Muslim scholars, right? And Therefore, we were able to achieve a curriculum that is of high cal caliber and has this rigor. Um, and so that way we were able to address them in an effective manner. Um, and really this comes from a lack of addressing deep existential questions that students have these kind of conflicts, right? And these deep existential questions in regarding to us as human beings is what really kind of puts that confusion in the minds and hearts of students. And so, um, alhamdulillah, this curriculum tackles those questions head on, right? And if we see the way that science talks about human beings, it talks about human beings in parts, right? It refers to the form and the function of a human being, uh, whether it's in an environment or within the body itself, but rarely addresses the human being as a whole, right? Of the very essence of what it means to be a human being. And taking that into account, the mind, body, and soul of each and every single individual. Right. So the con the idea this kind of comes at me is I have a friend of mine who is uh, actually she's a revert Muslim and she's been uh, a Muslim for about two, three years. And so at first she didn't share this with her family, but she had a niece who was about 16 years old that she was very close with. So she started to kind of share um, why she accepted Islam, what were the things that kind of she thought of and how she understood it. And immediately her 16 year old niece began bringing out all of these existential questions that she had, right? She was like, why are we here, right? What happens to me when I die, right? And these were the kinds of things that, you know, it seems like that age group of high school students really don't think about these things because of maybe the way that they behave and the things that they do. But when given the opportunity to discuss it, it's definitely on their minds, right? They are able to have deep discussions and bring out these questions, right? when the opportunity is given to them. So let's go through these five fundamental questions that um, this curriculum is based off of and the topics that are covered to answer those questions. So first and foremost, we have what is the origin of the human being, right? We start with where did we come from? So then we know where to, where to go, right? So this is where we, inshallah, will cover evolution and God's special creation, which inshallah will be the topic of Thursday's seminar. And then we move on to what is the human's essential nature, right? So that we understand what is a human being, right? What does it mean to be human? And so in this, we'll cover the topics of neuroscience, neuroscience reductionism, particularly artificial intelligence and how that connects to the soul of a human being. And then this is where we get into the future, right? Is what is the human's future, right? So we know where we came from now, where are we going? Our, where, what is the future entail for human beings? And we'll cover human enhancement and transhumanism under that topic uh, to answer that question. And then inshallah, we'll move forward to the age old mind boggling question of predestination, right? Are human actions predetermined? So here we'll discuss uh, fate and genetic determinism. So we'll cover some of that genetics that people were asking about as well, inshallah. And then last but not least, again, we have are humans unique in this universe? Right. So here we'll have a science and theological inquiry discussion about extraterrestrial life. Right. So kind of more beyond this world um, that we are known. And so here, inshallah, with these, we'll be able to discuss many of the questions that you guys have mentioned that you have uh, you would like to talk about as well. Um, and so before we do that, right, in order to answer these five questions, first, we need to ask a bigger, and more pertinent question. Right. Which is what do we even know and how do we know it right and this is where we get epistemology from and i'll turn it over to dr awesome who is the pioneer himself to address this nuanced discussion inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah 
Hola, Ali Sabi Mawala. It's really a pleasure to be uh, with you all uh, today. Uh, I am pinch hitting for two of our shiuch, so uh, please give me some grace, inshallah, Tala. But we'll go through um, this topic that uh, Sister Aisha has, has covered about the epistemology. Before I do so, I do want to kind of ask a question of the group uh, to get a little bit of engagement. Um, who uh, you can just put your arm i think you're not your arms up or your hands up in this uh, zoom thing but who here uh has read or heard about uh, that book by maurice bukal the bible the quran and science okay and for those i see some people aren't on the camera um so so that book did that does that inform the way people think about teaching science in their classrooms? Someone could perhaps unmute and offer a suggestion. Does it or does it not for you all? I love the book. I've used it, uh, the chat says, in some of my lectures. So what I want to paint before we get to epistemology is that in the dialogue between Islam and science, right, uh, we have to recognize that it's contemporary discourse that has set up this conflict between science and religion, particularly a discourse that has its roots, and I'll share this in my slide set, uh, in, in a European context in the post-Enlightenment Age of Reason era. And that Muslims, for various reasons, including uh, colonialism, have uh, an inferiority complex, have kind of taken the, 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 the discourse and tried to resolve it in many ways. Um, but we still have this sort of leitmotif of there being conflict. Uh, so the, 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 the book that we just mentioned by uh, Dr. Moïse Bukal was trying to do what we'd call um, Tafsir ilmi, the idea that we can do eisegesis, we can read through the Quran um, scientific discoveries. And the problem with that work as an academic would be that, that you have now put the marker, the threshold of, of truth of our tradition in that it reflects science or our present scientific understandings. And there have been other uh, sort of uh, trends within Islam and science discourse such as the idea of Islamization, uh, where we want to take subjects and we want to infuse them with a uh, epistemic framework, actually, uh, about how to understand evidences from various sciences and put them in a whole, right? Um, or, or others who have sort of taken the idea that we need to infuse values. So the Islam is a tradition of values. So as long as values and virtues are present, then uh, this does not matter what scientific enterprise you undertake. And I share this for you all, our teachers, um, but that notion of what science is for and how we engage from our tradition informs how we teach, whether it's subtly or overtly. Um, and what we're going to do today, and I'll share my slides in a second, is try to help us put things in a, in a singular register so that we don't feel that we're in a conflict modality where we have to respond that Islam says this or Islam says that. I think if you were to think about the, the the paragons of our tradition, if you were to say to them Islam and science, they would look at you cross-eyed. Well, what do you mean Islam and science? Islam is a worldview and science is a tool. Why are they on the same pedestal? Why do we think about that in that way? Uh, and uh, But however, given that the contemporary discourse is about conflict and we put religion and science, we've replaced religion with Islam and science, and all those overlays come into the way that we think about teaching and engaging. So that's kind of a little bit of a background to make us think critically about the way in which we, we engage these topics. So let me share my screen now, inshallah. Um, so, so I mentioned I'm pitch hitting, but I also would be remiss if I don't mention that the, the project that you are now getting some teaching from was a, and is a multidisciplinary international collaboration with many institutes, including HQEC and Islam, whose representatives are both on this call, um, but also Dar al Qasim, uh, the International Islamic University of Malaysia, uh, and, and others, and that this work was funded by the John Templeton Foundation. So the reason that we can benefit from our conversation today is that there was a external to the Muslim sponsor 
who helped create the materials through which we can create this this dissemination activity. So, so alhamdulillah for that. Uh, as I mentioned, that the, the the we enter this conversation uh, having a worldview of conflict, where on one side is science, and the other side is a religion. And you see here, this this cartoon does a lot for me when I teach. Because it shows you that on the one side, there are all these paragons, or you can even see Darwin there, perhaps, in the cartoon. But you have this notion of, of the scientists are doing things that are real, tangible, while the religious scholars don't have any instruments there on their hands, as you notice, right? They just have, perhaps, their their, their books uh, from their tradition. But they're not really doing anything while the other side is doing stuff to help make the world better. And the world of, of, of science is the one of empiricism, and rationality and claims that can be universal. But on the other side, you have religion where it's a, the domain of superstition, perhaps of just belief. I believe something, right? And that there are particular truths, not necessarily universal. What's also interesting in this cartoon, as I mentioned, does a lot for me when I teach, is that you can notice two different types of religious scholars here. You have the Muslim who often shies away from the discourse or turns away disinterested or dispassionate from this discourse, which might be a, 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 a response that is that is valid. But you, then you have uh, oftentimes the evangelical Christians who toe that line between religion and science and engage in a discourse in a certain way. So that's the, the framing that we all imbibe. And as Sister Aisha mentioned, that our goal was in this curriculum that is intended for not just for Islamic schools and high school students, but also Muslim colleges and perhaps even medical students, is to develop their capacities of the students to reason through perceived conflicts, because conflict is what's in the ether, right? Uh, but we want you to reason through those perceived conflicts. The term perceived is pretty important. And enhance their interest and in preparedness and, and, and intention for engagement at the junction of Islam and bioscience, right? So that this would be something that is not they're only aware of, but they're interested in pursuing and hopefully move that conflict uh, modality uh, away, right? So the notion that there has an inherent conflict would not, particularly within a Islamic worldview, would not be the, dom uh, the, the dominant way in which they think about these things. So she, she mentioned the five questions. I will not go through that again, but as you see, they, they connect. They're about the fundamental existential questions about the human being. And the features of the curriculum, which now I'll get to the reasoning exercise in a second, was developed in this way that we had seminars that were co-taught by a theologian and a scientist, right? We engaged in uh, in a way that we emphasized critical inquiry. So questions, as Sister Aisha mentioned, were, 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 were welcomed and encouraged, but there was also plurality, right? There was no notion of a definitive answer to something, but rather a journey and experience uh, to critically think, right? So we didn't want to say, here is what Islam says. All right, and when we say that, I say to students, go find me Islam, what is he saying, right? Because there is no such thing as Islam says this, right? But there are many Islamic views or perspectives on things, um, properly couched. We also focus on multimodal instruction, as you'll see when you move throughout the, the PD uh, later on, uh, and that we have the curriculum sort of focused on epistemology, which I'll share with you some now in a second. And then the curriculum is polished by people such as Sister Aisha, and brother Habib and uh, sister Shaza and others as well. So this was this was uh, the idea to get, make it ready for you to uptake. Uh, I will skip that. So let's get to what you'd asked me to present on. As I mentioned, I'm pinch hitting, so so bear with me. Uh, but this is I will give you a flavor of what the students got, but so you can understand how to the curriculum. So the students got this sense right. The first seminar was, and you will see when you download the modules that it had three parts had a notion of overlapping epistemologies. We had some uh, videos that talked about the unseen and is a revelation source of knowledge. And then we also talked about how do you reason through conflict, right? If there is perceived conflict. So that was what the students would get. And this was the instructional flow. We identify sources of knowledge. We define and classified relationships between propositions. I'll share with you what that means based on the source of knowledge, discuss levels of certainty and sort of assess the truth claims and then weigh these truth claims through an epistemological framework. So the idea, uh, obviously, is to build some skill sets and then imply them within that seminar, right? Um, so what I'll share with you now is kind of that those details, right? So what were the sources of knowledge? How do we think about them? Um, how do we think about classifying relationships between different types of propositions and claims made from these sources of knowledge? 
what are the types and levels of certainty of that knowledge, and then a little bit about weighing kind of propositions, right? So, so you take each item, or just uh, each sort of um, understanding or knowledge piece, and then apply it uh, within the seminar. So, what do we mean by epistemology? Epistemology means um, how you know, right? And then how you know what you know. So, so that's sort of it gives you as a big word for 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 that that idea of understanding sources of knowledge and then weighing through them. And there are many different schema within our tradition uh, that the theologians have put together for epistemology. For epistemology. The framework that we used is sort of an aggregate composite one that is within the, the tradition that sets out that there are four, and I'll give you a sense of why this is the case in a minute, but there are four um, sources of knowledge. So, so, so let me say one more thing. I'm sharing with you slides that I didn't prepare. These are slides that uh, Sheikh Omar Qureshi and Sheikh Hamza Karamali, right? Uh, Sheikh Omar was presently at Cambridge Muslim College, and Sheikh Omar Qureshi, uh, Sheikh uh, Hamza Karamali, who's at Basir Education, they put together. So, so for us, also in the group, we were kind of um, learning through the way that they had aggregated these different uh, epistemic frameworks. But in any case, here we go. So there are four sources, right, of of knowledge: the intellect, uh, right, uh, five senses, empirical knowledge, true reports testimonial knowledge and intuition in him. Now there are others as well. One might say that, you know, that there is uh, spiritual modes of knowledge, right? So in Gisha, for example, but these were the four that we discussed with students. Now, um, one might say that, well, where is scripture here? Where's revelation here, right? Where's that fall? So does someone have an answer for that? I can't see the chat, the system presenting, but if someone wants to unmute or someone can tell me what the chat says, but where where, where is where is the issue here then? The one says intellect. So, so yes, so, so the way that one would think about this is that the evidence coming from scriptural sources is also rationally understood right, that the basis of uh, our understanding that there is a Qur'an that uh, comes to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angel Jibreel Islam to Rasulullah is based on a testimony, a report. And the, the, the ongoing revelatory events over 23 years are based on testimonial reports. And when we look at each verse in the Qur'an and we say, well, each verse of the Qur'an Right, it reaches a level of tawatur in which that there are multiple chains and multiple reporters across time and space who met one another who could not have colluded, right, to put together the Quran. That is, it is on the back of a rational assessment of the testimonial evidence for that event. And so, we do are not a tradition that says that we just believe, but rather we interrogate the claims even of what our, our scriptural sources say, and we put it on a register of, of an epistemic register. So as I mentioned, right, there are testimony report, and that testimony report uh, is then based on an empirical evidence, right? So the person who said, I heard God, God Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's saying, I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say something. So the first report then is, is empirical, right? And that empirical then becomes testimony that the so-and-so saw, so-and-so saw, so-and-so saw. So my, I'm sharing this with you because that's the first part of making an intricative sort of epistemology that we have to recognize that the Islam and science didn't know to make sense, right? That it was all source of knowledge that came through us to channels that our intellect had to sort of understand and we had to weigh them. I mentioned spiritual mo the modes of knowledge and being on the side, but we're not talking about those. Okay. So with that, uh, then came the idea that, okay, we've talked about sorts of knowledge and there are those four, and how do we think about epistemology within the Quran itself, right? And what are the terms that the Quran uses to distinguish different levels of, 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 of certainty about those claims, right? Uh, and so what is the what are the registers in the Quran? So this verse in the Quran, 
uh, here delineates for us actually uh, all of them in one one verse. So Sheikh Sheikh Omar, uh, who put this together, uh, found this first that that it makes sense. So you'll see the terms here in Arabic. Those Arabic are in are highlighted that talk about levels of certainty. So the verse Allah says in the Quran, "Allah bin Lamishtan yuqul qawla min naqtal Masih ibn Maryam, mi Masih Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullah wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu, wa lakin shubha lahum." That they say that they had killed the the Masih ibn, uh, right? The 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 Messiah, the son of Maryam, who is the messenger, a messenger of Allah. But they did not wa ma qataluhu. They did not kill him. They did, they did not murder him. Wa ma salabuhu. They did not crucify him. Wa lakin shubha lahum. But however, they saw a uh, they were they were given a resemblance of that. And the people who disagree about this, they have doubt shak huh, about it. And they do not have any knowledge except for speculation. They follow speculation. And they do not kill him, certainly. Uh, that's the verse. So here you see all these terms, right? So shak is a state of they're shakam and they are in doubt. A state of it could be true or it could not be true. And I am an equipoise in between. They have no knowledge. Right? So if you're in a state of shak, of doubt of whether something is true or not true, then you actually have no knowledge about either way. Right? You have no true knowledge. You have no certainty, but you have no knowledge about that issue. But then they speculate. Right? So then you can have this um, probabilistic knowledge that maybe moving from that state of shuck, I have some other evidence that moves me towards it being true or towards it not being true. And when you move away from that state of equipoise, then you get a little bit of probability of trueness or probability of falseness. That is the level of one, right? Of probability, conjecture, presumptive knowledge. And they did not come certainly, but yet this notion that when you get all the way from probability at uh, probabilistic knowledge and you get repeated evidences, you can move close to the notion of certainty. But what's interesting here in this verse is the certainty here is now tied to how do they know that Allah SWT has said at the beginning of the verse that they did not kill him. Right? So that 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 perhaps certainty in this in this verse indicates in a way that certainty might reside out of our possibility except for in cases of revelation at times. So these are the levels of certainty that the students sort of then learn, right? So we talked about the four types of sources of knowledge. Now you have through this verse, this spectrum of certainty about claims that come from any source of knowledge, whether it is doubt in the zone of 50-50, so to speak, or some certainty that something is false, that will be volatile, or it's true yaqeen. And then in between, you have the zones of probability, where we have right likelihood of being false or likelihood of being true. So dhanu rajih or dhanu marjuh. Now, with that notion that you have source of knowledge there are, are making claims, then we have to understand when you make a judgment about a claim, so someone's made a claim, this has happened or that hasn't happened, but you have to assess whether that claim is based on conclusive evidences or probabilistic evidences. And that, those are the terms, dhanni al-qat'i. And what does it mean by dhanni al-qat'i? Well, when someone makes a claim about something that's qat'i, that means that it does not emit more than one meaning. It is univocal, using that idea, that term that it can only be this way. And a probabilistic claim means that there are possibilities. We are not certain that there could be multiple things, right? There can be multiple ways uh, of emitting. Uh, the claim emits multiple meanings, whether that be an empirical finding or whether that be something else, right, from Revelation. So the students then learn the notion of you have to make judgments about those claims. And then there are three types of judgments. This is where we get now the separation into what you traditionally think about. There's revelatory judgments, judgments based on revelatory sources. There are judgments based on rational sources and empirical ones. Right? So you have an empirical judgment that, that we can only know something from our five senses, and or we know something from our five senses, or we made an assertion that we know something from our, senses, from our five senses, and we make a judgment based on that, or rational. Right? These are statements that we know, but we don't need the census to tell us, like one plus one equals two, right? Um, or you can use scientific equations at the time, right? You can say, okay, well, we are now positing because of so-and-so law that this can't happen, right? 
You haven't empirically seen it, but we're positing something. That's a rational judgment or a revelatory judgment, right? These are statements that are known based on our nusus, the Quran and the Sunnah, right? And then we say this is a judgment based on that source. So the example here is fasting to Allah Allah's obligation. So you have judgments classified based on, right? The evidences that are marshaled for that from the sources of knowledge. But then there are two types of judgments. And I know I'm going through this in some detail. This is all perhaps somewhat new to all of you. But you have self-evident judgments that don't require thought or inferential that they require some thought. And I'll give you examples in a second. But this is, again, was for the students to have a reading grid through which they would then first identify claims, truth claims, and then assess them. So here's the example. Self-evident claim from relatively so those five, five pillars of Islam. You don't really need to think about that. It's sort of and Nasus would have been said, right? There's a hadith about it, and we're done. But then there's an inferential judgment. Okay, there is a hadith about and it's Quran, and they say about zakat and what is logic for zakat. Well, they don't talk about diamonds, gold, wheat, barley. So, how do we make a judgment about there being a zakat of diamonds, right? You have to make an inferential judgment. Okay, I'm not saying there's no zakat of diamonds, I'm giving you an example. All right, so don't say Asim Padella said there's no Zakat and Diamonds. So here's the fatwa. I'm, I'm giving an example of a judgment that one needs to make based on, on inference from other sources. Similarly, in rational judgments, right, self evident, there's one half, one is half of two. But then if you say, no, you know, we have to, I have to do something more, right? 40, I have to do uh, another step of calculation and that becomes inferential, right, based on a premise. Right, that division involves this. So now 40 divided by four divided by 10 is one. I have to do multiple steps, but also each is based on this idea that that division works in this sort of way. And empirical judgments similarly, right? That fire burns, okay. But in French judgment is that Pepto bismol trees indigestion. So here now you're saying, okay, yeah, fire burns, we can see, we see that, we, yeah, or we can make that empirical judgment. But when I'm making an assertion that something has a quality that will address your symptoms, I'm making inferential judgments. Just a little more thought. So here's an example uh, for us, and I wanna just leave it there for a second, right? So we had students thought about, well, is something in the category rational, empirical, or revelatory judgment, All right? So water boils, it's empirical, where we see that, we need our senses to see that, right? God exists. Is a rational proof, right? So we have within our tradition rational evidences for the existence of God, right? Like the contingency argument, or, uh, or uh, the cosmological argument, and so on and so forth. Uh, so our tradition is not based on okay, just a belief, but rather there's a rational uh, claim as well. Or maybe people might say the notion of, of design, right? But nonetheless, there is this use of rationality. It's not just okay. Revelation came and therefore we believe. Tylenol relieves pain. This is an empirical proposition. You would see, give 100 people Tylenol, see if it relieves pain. Force is mass times acceleration. Here, that first step we know, right? That's empirical, that we can make calculations. But then using that idea and making postulates about that in some other context could it also involve rational judgments. Paradise exists. We know that through the Nusus. And then humans will be resurrected, resurrected in the through Nusus, right? Through the Quran and Sunnah. Otherwise, we empirically, obviously, we will not know this. We can't know this. And then rationally, perhaps not, right? Uh, which has led to the discussions between philosophers uh, early on, predating Islam. The other piece for students then becomes, so now we move through source of knowledge. We move through certain levels of certainty of, uh, of claims and judgments. Then we talk about whether a judgment is necessary, possible, or possible. And here, the important thing for us is just to know that necessary means that it must always be the case. It can't be negated. But possible means that something can be affirmed or negated. right? And that's, that's the claim in both rational and empirical judgments. But the interesting aspect here, impossible means obviously can't be affirmed, that empirical judgments can only fall under possible rational judgments. And what does that mean? So from a theological perspective, we see the sunrise and things get warm. We see that, you know, when I drop a pen, if it's the, if it's the you know, gravity, if you want to call it gravity, causes it to move down and accelerate, 
and then it hits the you know hits the, the table of desk here. But it is not necessary for that to be the case. This correlation that we see, this association that we see is one that we observe, but it doesn't have to be the case. That opens up the space creatively for the notion that there can be miracles that break the pattern that we normally observe. So fire does not have to burn. We know this through a revelatory guidance to us about Ibrahim alayhi salam. It is not necessary, it is not intrinsic for fire to have to burn. Rather, there is a quality that God places within fire and permits then for that quality to cause burning. And we see that repeatedly, so that we call it a norm or some of the law in a sense, right? But it is not necessary intrinsically for that to be the case. You understand? So what we see and observe through our eyes and senses, our, you know, our hearing, taste, and smell is not necessary. It is but just in the realm of possibility. And this is particularly, particularly important when we start thinking about scientific claims. All right, so, so here's an example of a chart for rational judgments. And I won't go through them one by one here. But the idea here, again, of what is a rational judgment necessary, what is possible, what is it possible? So it's necessary in some cases, most, right, matter takes up space, for example. But all, a lot of things are possible, rational judgments, and there's some things that are impossible. But the important thing here is empirical judgments, right? So again, we see the idea that you have to put each judgment within not just a spectrum of of how sure we are, but also whether it's necessary, possible, and possible. Now, I will say that for our teaching of the students, and as you go through the teaching modules and adopt it in your own classrooms, we did not dwell on these this last piece here. Right? That we had step one was to understand the source of knowledge. Step two, uh, certainty levels of certainty. Step three was the notion of you know how you make judgments and how we weigh them. But this classification aspect was not so much involved in what you will hear in the subsequent uh, workshops. So to end, before we go back to questions, we had the idea that, and we presented the idea in the first seminar that there is an Islamic epistemology that allows you to have a wider scope than a naturalistic epistemology, which is how science operates today. That within Islamic epistemology, you, you make rational judgments, empirical judgments, and revelatory judgments, and I'm based on those sources, you can have a justified belief in something, right? In the naturalistic epistemology, meaning that things are just as they are, and there is no metaphysical, there is no ontological, right? There is simply what we can sense and see, so really empirical, and then we have what we can understand and think about and posit through rationality, that those are the only two domains that are involved in, in, in modern science, and therefore, everything else, right? Revelatory judgments, obviously, revelation is not a source of knowledge for them. In Kashaf and Ham, those are not sources of knowledge for them. So they would discount any claims made from these other uh, uh, other sources of knowledge. Um, at, at offhand, right? Uh, that, that would be the gut reaction. Therefore, everything else is unjustified, uh, which leads to these conundrums of sort of pseudoscience that Karl Popper talks about, right? With whether, if that, the only thing that we know about, the only way that religion can have uh, validity would be if it makes claims that are falsifiable, right? This idea of pseudoscience versus science. So you get these conundrums that are, are put together because of this dismissal offhand of lovely, revelatory sources of knowledge. But I started our session saying that even those revelatory sources of knowledge are based on rational claims. They come through us through testimonial reports and at the first instance, empirical ones, observations. So that dismissal offhand is uh, paradoxical, even within the naturalistic or rational empirical domain. Okay, so I will stop there, inshallah. Um, happy to take no questions but if you must i'll happy to take a couple and inshallah i will let uh, sister aisha and the rest of the islam crew finish up dr awesome
Alhamdulillah. So what I'd like to do is just to kind of give you guys an idea of um, what the curriculum, particularly in terms of uh, this unit entails. So that we see the kind of the resources that are available for teachers to use. So that way it makes this very heavy nuanced discussion a little bit easier for us to implement in the classroom. As you saw, Dr. Awesome was presenting quite a lot of probably terminology that you might not have been aware of. Um, but there is resources to, alhamdulillah, help with that as well. So first and foremost, when you go on to like as uh I believe actually we haven't mentioned it, but this is um, free resources that are available online for all of you to be able to access. Um, and so when we get to the website, um, you are asked to put in your information just so that way we kind of understand who is uh, using the information as well as a um, kind of just a claim that we will give the credit, do credit where it's due. Um, but Beyond that, you will see that each unit that we will cover, inshallah, we will cover unit two and three in the next session. And Dr. Asim gave us a little bit of an idea of the epistemic framework. But the first unit here is this topic, as Dr. Asim mentioned, what do we know and how do we know it? And so there is the accompanying slide deck that goes along with the lessons as well as the instructional video. Um, so here we have Dr. Omar and Dr. Hamza or Sheikh Hamza that are the ones who presented this uh, lesson or this unit particularly. But what I want to really share with you guys is the materials that are mentioned here, right? Um, so there are supplemental materials that will help you to make sure this is understandable information for your students. As Dr. Had, uh, Asim had mentioned, the sources of knowledge, right? So we have an activity so students understand what do those sources of knowledge mean, right? What does it mean to have uh, ilham, right? So I know Dr. Awesome just mentioned those words and we're expected to know them, hopefully, inshallah. But here, most students probably don't know these words, right? They aren't aware of an example of what ilham might be, right? So in the lesson, we give those examples as well as have activities for you to give to the students so that way that is clarified to the student. Um, and then we have in each lesson other materials. So the things that I want to point out is there's a worksheet, right? For students to go through and teachers to discuss these various judgments that Dr. Asim had presented, right? Have them work through, what do they think? Is it a rational understanding? Is it an empirical uh, data that they're looking at? Or is this from revelatory information that we know this knowledge, right? And the two things that I feel would be, are very helpful for teachers is, like Dr. Asim mentioned that the existence of God is a rational judgment, right? And that's really shocking to a lot of students, right? That no, this is something we get from revelatory information, right? But in reality, it's a rational judgment. And this document goes through, how do we understand it as a rational judgment? And the same goes for proofs of prophethood, right? That Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a, indeed a true prophet. And how do we know that rational, right? What are our rational evidences to make that claim? Um, and then as you can see, there are accompanying assessments for each of those as well. So I wanted to kind of just run through some of that material that will hopefully help and assist in teaching this very nuanced um, content that perhaps, again, might be a little bit of learning for ourselves as educators. And then we'll be able to effectively do that um, teaching for the students. So then... Now I'll leave it for questions and answers. So uh, inshallah, if there are any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, if you really do feel that it would be easier for you to unmute and ask the question, we welcome that as well, inshallah. And Dr. Asim, uh, I know you have to go. So if whenever you need to, please feel free to, to uh, take your leave, inshallah. But jazakallah khair, definitely uh, yeah. very beneficial and helpful. So any questions? Let's see one thing. Uh, so I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, 
just as a conversation, I, I'm not even sure if it applies to teaching, but yeah, I would like to understand it for myself. Something uh, that um, Brother Asim said, and I thought that was very interesting that um, it is a quality of fire to burn, but it can be seized, right? So that part I understood, but then I, something, and correct me if I'm saying it wrong, that that is not intrinsically the case. So it it could be qualified as a possible or not possible that fire burns. Um, like, um, you know, miracles are, like, aren't miracles supposed to be something impossible um, and yet happens? So, you know, fire doesn't burn, sea splits open, or Isa has a, you know, virgin birth. If we make that as a, by nature, scientifically, as a, always a possibility, then it's not a miracle. Then it can repeat and then it can happen easily. Right, like the idea of miracle is that it is not uh, possible, and yet you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did it. So you know laws of nature can be bent according to the Creator's will, but otherwise they're not possible. So I got a little bit confused there. Um, if you know that can be explained a little bit. Yeah. So this is a good question. Uh, uh, uh... And so I think we're getting some uh, a little bit uh, hung up on the semantics, and perhaps I wasn't as, as clear. Well, I, and 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 certainly you should go back to your shiuch and and, uh, and ans answer the question or ask him the question. But what I was saying was that it is not necessary, right? Meaning something is something, some occurrence that we see that relationship between the you know uh, the antecedent and the and the event. Right, or the cause and effect, let's say, is that a necessary connection? And what I was saying was that it is not a necessary connection, meaning that it's always 100% has to be the case. And that empirical judgments, the ways that we see, the senses that we use, we have to recognize that, that those judgments are possible. Now, it might be highly probable, right? It might be near certain, you know, near certain that this always happens. But it isn't intrinsically always the case that this always has to happen, right? That there is an ability. That's what I was saying. That empirical judgments are in the realm of possible. They're not impossible. They're not necessary. They're in the realm of possible things, possible relationships between cause and effect. Your point is a nuance where you're saying, well, if it is not necessarily always the case, uh, then the miracles aren't miracles, but then you have to look at the definition of miracles, right? Miracles are defined in a way that there's an interruption of a perception of a cause and effect, right? right. Okay. Like has, there's no need for it, right? He's above all needs, and he has no need for, for uh, things to happen in a repeated pattern, but we're saying that the normal pattern of occurrences to which we attribute cause and effect do not hold true, but the attributing of a cause and effect is us, right? And so now, so if you want to have a definition of what a miracle is, you have to, then you can say that that, that complicates the matter, right? So, but the definition that I'm providing you is that there is an apparent, a perceived cause and effect that does not hold true. We're not talking about the ijaz of the Quran here. We're talking about the natural world, huh? So that's another notion that we were talking about ajaz and the Quran and so on and so forth. The inimitability of the Quran, that's a different level of miracle. I'm just talking about the natural world miracles that we're talking about. That's a disruption of a perceived cause and effect. And that perception is ours. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, inshallah. Ta take care. Away. I'm going to hop off. And just kind of to, to build on that, um, as Dr. Uh, Sheikh Hamza mentions actually in the lesson as well, that these are associations that we generally have, right? This is because for us, we've always seen it this way. We assume that this is always the way it is. And so when a miracle happens, it as breaking that normal assumption, right? And this is why we have that understanding. And so uh, he kind of talks a little bit more in detail about what that regulative association is that we normally have, right? And so a miracle, since it goes against that regular association, that's where we, we see them as miracles, right? 
Um, but again, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is possible, right? Within the realm of possibility. Um, just to kind of go through some of the questions that are mentioned here in the chat, how long would it take uh, to teach this curriculum? So each each lesson, in there are six units. And so in each of the six units, there are about three to four lessons. Um, some of them have two lessons. And so most of those are geared to be a regular classroom uh, time period. So about 45 to 55 minutes. And so in general, it would probably take a semester, but not a complete semester, right? You would have to kind of integrate this within your teaching. Um, so for example, if you are talking about evolution, right, you can bring in the three lessons that we have in the unit of evolution and God's special creation, and then teach it alongside with what you are teaching, right? So this is a supplemental curriculum that you will add to a regular curriculum. Does that make sense? Um, so in general, you can spread it out throughout the school year, right? Or within one, one semester, however you'd like. Um, we do have suggestions for um, in each lesson that will tell you that this is a recommended place to place this lesson, right? So like I mentioned, that when you are talking about evolution in biology class, right, that this is where you would bring in these supplemental lessons. Um, what grade levels or ages and, and will two 60 minute classes a week for nine weeks be feasible? Um, so this is geared towards high school students and beyond, right? So our focus group was actually high school students and graduate or college students. Um, and so, like I mentioned that, you know, kind of those later years of high school students are really well equipped to be able to comprehend such nuanced information. Um, so that's kind of our target group. Uh, um, so grade levels, I would say, again, all of high school, but primarily 11th and 12th grade, they would be able to really have that kind of background knowledge, right, to be able to kind of tackle the information that is being covered in these lessons. Um, two 60 minute classes a week for nine weeks. I would have to do the calculation on that. Um, but it, it would be feasible, inshallah. Um, based on, again, the only thing that I would give a caveat to is that if you allow time for discussion, right, that's the only thing you need to accommodate for is how much discussion is happening within the classroom. What are the ideas the students are coming with, right? And so therefore, it might take slightly longer than... Um, as mentioned, um, but we try to accommodate uh, that timing within the class, within the lessons as well. So if you take a look at the lessons um, and kind of calculate that, I would say a nine week program, 60 minutes, two times a week should be able to cover most of the lessons in that, in this curriculum, inshallah. Any other questions? You're welcome. My pleasure, inshallah. Anyone else would like to unmute or ask their questions? If not, so inshallah, if they do, more questions do come as you're thinking about processing and we, as we finish up here, um, feel free to put that in the chat as well. But what I'd like to do is to, inshallah, um, kind of give you a heads up of what is the next seminar, inshallah. Um, let's see. So in the next seminar, inshallah, what we will do cover on Thursday, again, same time and same place, is that we'll answer the fundamental question of the origin of the human being. So this is where we will cover, uh, inshallah, the topic of evolution and how does that um, integrate with our understanding, right? Obviously, Islamic understanding of the special creation of Adam alayhi salam, right? Um, and so then we will also cover the second uh, topic as well, which will be the next fundamental question of what is the human uh, essential nature, right? So what does it mean to be human being? Um, and th in that we will talk about neuroscience reductionism, which is a very uh, predominant thought in the scientific realm uh, at the moment. Artificial intelligence, which is something that is very um, kind of up and coming, as well as how all of that relates to the soul. So inshallah, that will be our discussion for next time. Um, and again, maybe just a little bit of homework to brush up on your uh, evolutionary topics, right? Of how evolution and what are those evidences, right? Because we will what those evidences are quickly, right? But then how do we deal with it, inshallah? 
Um, so I apologize that this session was not as interactive that I had um, wanted it to be or I would have wished it to be. I know it's Muharram, so uh, uh, Ashura, so everyone, many of you might have been fasting. So hopefully, inshallah, that would be a, uh, an excuse of why we didn't have you guys talk too much. But inshallah, because this was kind of more of setting that uh, framework, right, that theoretical framework. And then we will, and really, I want to start with being more reflective of our own education and what our knowledge is, and then we can move forward of how to accomplish this in our teaching. Um, so I wanted to be more reflective this session. And then inshallah, in the next couple of sessions, you will see, we will have a lot more activities, right? We'll have you guys kind of grapple with what that information is, how do we uh, interpret that knowledge, as well as discussion with uh, amongst ourselves of how do we then apply that in the classrooms? Um, so with that, inshallah, what that is what we are looking forward to in the next session, inshallah. Um, let me just check to see if there are any other questions. Okay, and then last but not least, what I would like you guys to do, again, part of that reflective learning, that, inshallah, and uh, kind of feedback for us as well, is that I'd like you to, um, there is a QR code here, and let me put in the chat the link as well, so that if that is easier, inshallah, that would be easier for you guys to access, um, is that we will... One second. Let me get that link for you guys. So here I want you guys to kind of think about, um, do you feel that you've learned something beneficial today or something new that is going to help in your teaching of bioscience and Islam in your classroom? And so this is the link to access that as well. Let me put back the um, QR code. So if that is easier, that might be a little bit easier to access if you're, if you're on your laptop and then you, you can use your phone to, to scan that QR code. Um, but we want to make sure that we are constantly getting your feedback and I want you guys to be involved. And so I would like you to share with us, uh, is there something that you've learned that you feel that you would be able to apply within your classroom and actually enhance your teaching of science or even Islam, right? So we can obviously, a lot of these lessons go hand in hand. So even in Islamic studies classrooms, we'd be able to uh, apply many of these concepts as well, inshallah. And with that, um, jazakallah khair. Uh, if there is any other quick questions, please do let me know. But with that, we will end. Jazakallah khair, all of you uh, for attending. And really appreciate your involvement. Inshallah, looking forward to more involvement in the next session. Uh, again, same time, same place on Thursday, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Um, with that, I also would like to make dua that inshallah, may Allah SWT make this beneficial to all of us. May Allah SWT put barakah in this and give guide us to be excellent educators for the betterment of our ummah's future. And may this be a sadaqah jariah for all of us, the more that we propagate and implement it, inshallah. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasna wa fil akhirati hasna wa qina adhab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-muslin. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.